This show has been um, such an honor for us to put on, and the response has been amazing. Um, we were, it was supposed to run through November 3rd, and uh, we just decided to extend it pretty much through the rest of this month, so it'll go up through uh, Thanksgiving weekend. It is really an honor to have Jen Stark, Kelsey Brooks, and Andy Moses with us tonight. Uh, Jen drove from all the way downtown, which is a seat, <laughs> and uh, Kelsey from all the way in San Diego. So, uh, and Andy all the way from Venice, which can be a bitch sometimes. It can be a bitch. Um, I couldn't believe, I've wanted to show uh, these two new artists to the gallery, Jen Stark and Kelsey Brooks, for some time, and I started, we started reaching out to them two, three, four years ago, but uh, as is, is uh, often the case with very hot, in-demand artists, it took a while to get this together. Andy I've worked with for quite a long time, and it seemed like there were a lot of core uh, ideas that each of these artists are exploring that would make an interesting show where a, a lot of the um, themes that they're working with are sourced from the same areas. I think uh, when you look around the room, first of all, I'm just, it's such an exciting uh, uh, way that the works talk to each other and uh, hang with each other. Um, and the first thing people notice is this kind of psychedelic uh, use of color and form, and it's the uh, pieces feel like they're moving and so on. And, uh, and so the first response a lot of people ask me, is it about psychedelics? And I say, no, it's about nature, and it's about uh, science and molecular biology and forces of uh, geologic and cosmic energy. Um, but I do, I think, probably be good to start off and just ask you, uh, what hallucin <laughs> hallucinogens do you prefer? <laughs> All of them. Uh, um, I think the easiest way to go through this is um, give you all, uh, beyond the work in the show, just a little bit of background visually of um, each of these artists' work, and then hopefully we'll go through in somewhat of an informal way, rather than going with one artist and the next and the next, we'll start to talk about some of the, the themes that are common to each of them and, and, and your different approaches to exploring those themes. So Jen, why don't we start with you since cool. ladies first and you're next to me and your work is up on the screen. Sounds good. Uh, my name is Jen Stark. Uh, I was born in Miami and moved to LA like six years ago. Um, I started becoming an artist, I think through my grandpa because he was, um, he lived in Miami as well, and he was kind of like a hobby artist. He would do like landscapes and watercolors and stuff. So he would, he would invite me over to do little like sessions with me, like one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and he had like a great love of nature and animals, and I think that kind of helped inspire me and wanted me to become an artist. And yeah, so that's, that's kind of where I got the first art seed planted in me, and I think my parents saw that and kind of like fostered it. And um, yeah, I mean, so my artwork is, it's based off of a lot of things inspired by nature, um, a little bit of psychedelic imagery. Um, I love like <clears throat> cosmic, just cosmic mystery and like how sacred geometry and um, designs in nature have this like universal um, look like let's say the like a Fibonacci spiral how it's in like all sorts of designs like from the Milky Way down to like a tiny seashell um, you see similar themes that like carry its way through and I'm kind of like trying to you know just dive deep into that and try to discover new things through my artwork as well. Um, I'm also really interested in color and how in nature color is either an attractant or a repellent. So you have like a super colorful mushroom on the ground that's telling you not to eat it or you have this beautiful berry on a tree that wants you to come closer. So I love like that interaction of color. Um, 
And so yeah. there's a, an element of, of attraction and danger in a lot of things. So there's a, an yes. expressive quality. Let's just run through um, some of the slides of you working. And that's, this is where? This is in that's in the Miami, Miami airport. airport. So that, yep. And that's another mural. That's in Culver City, just probably like 10 minutes away. This was like a 60 foot mural. Um, pretty mammoth. We used like big boom lifts to paint it. Um, so I, I hand draw like the whole design with a pencil first. <laughs> On the building or yeah. unbelievable? It's, it's not projected. I kind of just like do it by eye mm -hmm. and then kind of dot them to get, dot all the colors and pretty much paint by number after that. So we knocked that out in like eight days or something. Amazing. And that's another view of it. That's at Platform LA. And this one, Chromatic Cascade, is in the Arts District in downtown. And it's, it's the largest mural that I've done. I think it's like 200 feet by like 30 feet. Um, and this was another huge one. And I, I just love like, I love like playing with architecture with my work and <coughs> kind of making it seem like it's taking over the building rather than just like a painting on a wall. Mm -hmm. um, making it seem like it's like oozing down and part of it. Um, how did the public art projects um, start for you? Um, a lot of the murals, usually people just contact me. They'll email me and say that they have, you know, a building they want me to paint. Or sometimes I'll apply for public art calls. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. <laughs> well, it's amazing to me um, to see how productive you are with, with the scale of the projects you were involved with. Um, you just got back from two weeks in Fiji painting on a, on a project doing public art uh, for the... The Fijians, yeah. Fijians, uh, <laughs> some schools. Yeah, that was amazing. We were there for like two weeks. It was a group of like 10 artists. Um, and we just painted on schools and a community center. And it was really cool like interacting with the kids while we painted. And um, it's, it's a really sweet and like amazing culture. Everybody was really awesome. Fantastic. Um, I want to talk to you about a little bit of the, uh, the visual effect of some of your pieces later on, so we'll get back to that. Kelsey, you grew up in Colorado. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> and initially were pursuing a science background, or science that was, was an interest for you and, and uh, started to practice as a biologist. Is that correct? Microbiologist, yeah. Microbiologist. Yeah. So I studied microbiology in college. Um, and I worked at the Centers for Disease Control for two years, um, and then I switched to a biotech company in San Diego. That's how I got to San Diego. <clears throat> and before that, and during that time, I was just, as Jen's grandfather was, a hobby artist. I just liked drawing. I just liked the idea of trying to render shape or trying to render form. I just thought it was like magic, and I was not any good at it. And so I was like, well, there's got to be something there's got to be something to it. So I just kept practicing and kept practicing. Um, and then it just sort of took over my life. I really loved it. And so I pursued, so I quit science um, thinking that I could go back to it if I needed to. But art, art making was really fun. Art making and surfing were really, really fun. And I was like, <laughs> let's just try and do that. And no more science. And, my wife loved that idea, and so did my parents. <laughs> <laughs> they really encouraged me, um, but I really, was, really enjoyed it. And it was fairly recently, I mean, it was ten, about 10 years ago that you, you yeah, embarked yeah. on this path? Yeah, exactly. But there's a lot of science and background that you bring to your work. Um, you know, it's fascinating to me to see um, how concretely these abstract, fairly free-form looking paintings are based. You know, you have um, a painting like this, um, which is based on a uh, molecular structure of a toxin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, 
that is a batrachotoxin molecule. So if you look at the center of each one of those, it looks like a bullseye or a target. Each, the center of each one of those would be the location of an atom inside of this molecule. This molecule, um, like I said, is batrachotoxin. It's one of the most um, lethal neurotoxins known to man. And it exists inside of um, beetles. And then these frogs, these poison dart frogs, eat the beetles. And it concentrates that toxin in, inside of these glands behind their, behind their ears, behind their tympanic, tympanic membranes. Um, and so the natives in this area will, will um, catch these frogs and then wipe the tips of their darts with that toxin. And it, when it gets shot into a bird or a deer, um, they fall like that. They're, they're dead instantly. So I just thought it was really interesting to be painting molecules. And some of these over here, um, this is lithium. If you go back to the previous one, so this, the, uh, yeah, that one right there, stop. So that is serotonin. That's the molecule serotonin. And there, just like the center of each one of those little flowers, is the location of the atom. If you took the actual atom and you flattened it out into two dimensions, and then that would, those are the accurate locations of these, um, of, the, of, the, of the atoms. And so this, this is something that I learned in, in biochemistry when I was in college, and this is sort of molecular shorthand that we would use when we were trying to make up molecules for testing. Um, but I just kind of took that idea and then just started making art with it. And then that, just that idea of taking some sort of scientific empiricism, something that is based in science, um, and then building an art practice on top of it is what I'm still doing. That's still kind of my goal, is to find scientific, scientific ideas and then just grow them into art. I think that's fantastic. If you looked at my um, organic chemistry books, you'd probably see doodles that, <laughs> had I gone that direction, would have looked like that because the reading part of it was <laughs> difficult. <laughs> So um, did you, when you first started doing this, they're, they're based on these structures. How did this evolve to a um, notion of using that structure um, to be the basis of these paintings? Because you, I mean, it's such an interesting, unusual way you've built out from these very scientific, you know, diagrammatic um, structures. So how did these start? Um, so these, these started, so I, when I quit my science job, initially I was doing figurative work. I was painting lots of these chimeras, so half, half animals, half humans, just all sorts of crazy shit. And I did a show in London with all that work and like nothing sold from the show. And I was like, fuck, I spent a year doing this and I flew all over London and we did all this, made all this effort and nothing sold and like, I wasn't even happy with it. Like it sucked making the work. And I was like, why am I doing this? And so I stopped making it was a traumatic couple months, but I stopped making figurative work and I just was like, well, what do I want to make? And so I just started making circular paintings with like the center being a focal point and then like things rating out. So not too dissimilar to what you see right here with this red Fibonacci sequence. Um, and I was like, well, this is pretty fun. I like doing this, but like it doesn't mean anything. Like there's nothing rooting this. And so I was like, well, what do I know? And I started thinking about molecules and it was, it was just like a single day where I was like, well, let's take all these paintings with these, you know, these circles and just place those on the location of the atoms. And then we're doing something interesting. Then I'm using my scientific background, my understanding of organic chemistry and molecular biology. And then I'm marrying it with this new idea of art, this place I wanted to go. And that, that first painting, which was that serotonin painting right there, I was like, well, this is the first painting that is like me. Like, there were, I don't know, a ton of people in the world that could have made that painting. I'm not saying I'm so great and like, I'm the only, I'm the smartest person in the world. I'm saying like, I have a weird, unique background because I just abandon shit all the time. And like, it allowed me to do that. And I was like, well, once I made that, I was like, wow. So there's, and I made, I did probably like four or five years of these paintings. And I was just like, there's the, the pastures are green. There's so much to do. And that was really exciting. And I could see the result would surprise you. You wouldn't know that you would end up there starting with that process, no. necessarily. That's all life, though, I feel like. Yeah, right? like, yeah. That's crazy. What am I doing here? <laughs> so Andy, uh, thank you. Um, Andy, you grew up uh, here in LA, uh, in Santa Monica, and um, your dad, I, I understand, was an artist. He was an artist also, <laughs> like Jen's dad. <laughs> Yeah, um, and uh, talk, to talk a little bit about like what that was like and, and how you started to see yourself 
um, uh, evolve, um, what your thoughts were as you were growing up in terms of uh, what your path might be? So I grew up seeing a lot of art in the house I grew up in, Ed and all his cohorts in the Ferris Gallery. There was always work up. And if you ever saw me looking at it too much, he would say, what are you looking at? Why are you looking at that? He really didn't want me or my brother to become artists. So it was sort of off the table. Uh, I did grow up by the ocean, went surfing a lot. That was my life as a teenager. But I did have this kind of scientific interest like Kelsey. But mine ended much sooner. Mine ended by the end of high school. Once I was around, I, I had a class where I was supposed to teach to tutor these genius kids that had just come in to the high school. And once I started tutoring them, I realized I'm in way over my head. <laughs> so I sort of gra gradually shifted to in uh, interest in film. And it's interesting, film, I think, has really influenced my painting, too, because I can remember vividly going to see uh, 2001 Space Odyssey when I was six years old, and there's that final sequence where you're moving through infinity. And that notion, that kind of space of infinity, and that space you get when you're surfing, when water is moving and shifting, light is shifting in un really unpredictable ways. But you feel like this real connection to this source, this kind of infinite source of energy. So I think that became the basis of where I would go in painting. But I went to CalArts to study film. And I had a, it was a very conceptual background, John Baldessari, Barbara Kruger, these were my teachers. And we, I was starting to film and video and some conceptual art, but I did a series of paintings that were actually based on Ed's paintings. It was a per performance called Father Knows Best, where I recreated some of his paintings and then destroyed them at the opening. But it was in the act of touching paint for the first time that it was like a drug. It was like I couldn't believe I was, it was always taboo. I was supposed to never touch paint, never look at it, never think about painting. So once I painted, I realized it was something maybe in my DNA, and it felt very good. To, and it didn't take long from there to just start trying everything out that I could try with paint. And this painting right here was done in 1986, this rock-like form. But it's not really a rendered painting. It was really done through like paint reactions. And can we get the next one? Uh, this was right shortly after, about 87 or 88. I was making these galactic black and white paintings in New York with these sort of backgrounds. And then I would float these shapes. But it was all done through other means other than drawing and rendering and traditional painting. It was all done through experimentation, mixing paint together, and kind of letting it guide me and guide I was interested in this kind of imagery, but I really let the paint kind of take, take different forms and lead me to the kind of imagery that I, so it was sort of like a circuit. There was an input of doing these organic things, and then they would end up looking like organic things in nature, and then I would push, I would, you know, if it started to look like a rock, I'd do a series of rocks, or if it looked like a galaxy, I'd do a series of galaxies. So I always let, can we go to the next slide? The paint kind of tell the story, so to speak. But then, this is 88, this is when I started silk screening stories from the New York Science Times on either side of a central image. This sort of brought me back to my roots of conceptual art and I was interested in t to see how these paintings could exist with this informational aspect. So there were information about the formation and disintegration of the universe on kind of micro and macro scales, all things I was interested in. And I wanted to sort of set up the filmic, a little sort of film background, this idea you'd have these sort of multiple images all interacting with each other to tell a story, but to tell a story that was also ambiguous, that it, you kept searching for sort of what, what you're looking for in these. Mm -hmm. And they would tell different stories. I spent a lot of time puzzling these together, actually. We can go through a couple more. But it's funny, these circular shapes or these rock-like shapes are something that uh, I feel pretty rooted in. They, they sort of kept coming back. That one's about dust particles and uh, underwater sea hitchhikers. So it was always a macro-micro element going on in these. This rock-like form I brought in again when I started working with color. I didn't really work, I worked all black and white through the 80s and then started introducing color in the 90s. 
and this rock-like form sort of keeps coming back. And then they got sort of looser and more kind of psychedelic and hallucinogenic during the, the, the 90s. I really wanted to sort of explore. Again, these are done with floating paint in water and letting it expand. And they create, sort of like Kelsey's work, like these molecular structures. So there was always a micro and macro. Let me keep going. And then go back one. So I was doing these that kind of looked galactic or, or underwater. I think there's always been this interest of mine in above and below, inside, outside, micro, macro, galactic, aquatic, and finding these kind of ambiguous forms that inhabit these spaces. Keep going. So that's early 2000s. And then I moved to California. That's one of the first paintings I did moving back to LA. Um, for the first time, I had light in my studio. I was working in the dark in New York for 18 years. And uh, I had light pouring through the window of my studio. And it, I was making all these dark paintings, which just didn't make sense. So these are all pearlescent white. It's all one color. And I found a way to manipulate it on the surface. Again, a whole different approach to what I was doing with the oil and water paintings. Um, creating a kind of drawing that wasn't really drawing. It's like paint moving across the surface and then leaving a trace of where it's been. And you get light and shadow, but it's all just one color. Um, then uh, I started moving to these ones which were more landscape-esque. Um, this color palette is very similar to the color palette in this circle over there. It's the first time I used sort of the darks and then these pearlescent colors. That really has that 2001. It does, definitely. Theory. There was a whole series of paintings in the, we're out 2010, I'd say, that looked like 2001. <laughs> There's one it's in the Wiseman collection, Permian Basin, from that same period of time. Uh, and then I started doing these spirals about 2008, 2009. Um, they were spirals on a square. Let's go to the next one. Again, there's that kind of same color palette. Um, then I moved sort of back into these horizon-based paintings. We can click through a few. And started playing with shape more, vertical curves. And this one was kind of about alchemy, which is another interest of mine for a long time. Alchemy kind of preceded the natural sciences. And it was this idea that you could transmute gold, or rather lead into gold, but only if you were highly evolved. So. That was uh, my mission to get highly evolved. <laughs> Keep moving. That's the back side of the same painting, which is an alchemical drawing from the early 1600s. Like forms, again, which kind of connected to work I had done in the 80s, but now they were much on a much larger scale. And they were done differently. This is the largest painting I've ever done. It's called Strange Attraction. It's 12 feet tall and 8 feet wide in two panels. And immediately after doing this painting, I became interested in the circular shape again. And kind of, I was doing these sort of vast, infinite landscapes. And then I wanted to make something more condensed and more contained and have it, rather than have it be an object floating in a background, have it be the totality. So it's both space and a form and a thing and an image and a picture. So I feel like I brought a lot of the past into these recent circles. One of the things that, that strikes me about each of your work is just the incredible amount of detail and um, time that it takes to make the work. Um, and so in that process, um, how, do, how do you each um, approach that process do you i mean I, kelsey when i see pictures of you working in your studio or same with you jen and andy i know I, you know you're when i'm in your studio there's an intense level of concentration on what you're doing you know they're, they're very painstaking to bring to fruition do you um talk about that process how how does is that a meditative process for you do you know where you're going with that process. Each of your pieces also has a level of improvisation, it feels to it, that there's an organic quality where the pieces start to evolve. For me, it's, it's definitely meditative. Um, I've always loved like just creating 
work on like a tiny level and just like zoning into it and kind of just like losing losing yourself and um, it's almost like healing it's it's definitely meditative um, and I was actually a fibers major in college which is like kind of like textiles but it was more conceptual um, so like all the all the people that were in that major had one thing in common and it was like this like lab this love of labor intensive work and like just like accumulation and like what it means and all that sort of stuff so um, yeah I mean I've always loved just zoning out and meditating on my work it's <clears throat> awesome Kelsey you, your work I mean when I look at you know, I don't know if any of you had a chance to kind of zoom in, but you see what you think is the overall composition, but then the closer you get to the pieces, they just kind of re recede in an infinite way to um, this kind of microcosm of the overall uh, composition. Um, What's your, what's your process in going through that? Is it um, also meditative for you or? It's really slow. It takes a long time. Mm -hmm. um, is it meditative? I don't know. I, what do, what's the definition of meditation, I guess? I don't know. Well, I can't imagine having the patience to do some of these pieces that each of you do without kind of being in a meditative state. You know, yeah. where you're patient with. Yeah, and, I get, and, and, yeah. and kind of in a zone. I continually have to bring my mind back to what I'm doing, right? So in that regard, I guess there is, it dovetails a little bit with meditation in the sense that I'll be painting and then I'll be catching myself thinking about like, what, was I right when I got to that argument with my wife? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> back, to the, back, back to painting. And then you're like, oh, what was I supposed to pick up at the grocery? And like, oh, back to painting. You know, this happens a thousand times a minute. Um, or more, and so that process, I guess it would be meditative. It's not necessarily fun, but I guess meditation doesn't imply fun. But sometimes, there's days, it is quiet. So in my studio, it's me and two assistants, and it is quiet, we're using our headphones, um, or just listening, listening to quiet music. And that can be a reprieve from like the chaos of like Instagram and kids, well, in my case, kids and wife and stuff like that. So if I'm in my studio, that's like my little spot and it can be quiet and chill. And I'm kind of introverted, so it's like a place where I can feel comfortable introverted, being introverted. Um, in, in terms of the choices you're making as the painting is progressing, do you have a, um, in terms of color that your color choices you're making, for instance, um, is that something that is improvisational for you? Do you have a, an idea ahead of time of where you're going, like with that first painting that we saw, yeah. the serotonin. Um, so a lot of these paintings, like they, they begin with the rigid structure of, of empiricism. So I kind of know what I'm doing, whether it be a number sequence or whether it be these molecules, I know where everything begins, but I never really know where it's going to end up. I just begin painting and I follow the system of rules that I've, play, I've set out for that show. So in a way, I don't really know what they're going to look like either. And in almost in a way, it doesn't really matter. Like I, I make it, I set out these rules, like there's a set of four rules that we have to follow to make this painting. And then I know where I have to begin painting. And then I start. And then it's just sort of fun after that. It just you know, becomes a, a surprise at the end of it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But um, yeah, I don't, I, don't have, I don't really have a vision of where I'm going. I just start making. You talk about the four rules. Are they the same rules for each painting, or do do, do the, Oh no, the rules the are yeah. The rules are always shifting. Yeah. But yeah, usually for a show, I'll have one consistent concept, um, and then I'll just I'll do variations on in there. But it's the same rules that will create the whole show. And usually, it's really what I found so interesting is that so much in life, you know, there's what, four or five fundamental constants in the universe? I mean, other than that, it, everything is just variables based on those five things. And so I've, I've, you can make an entire show off just like one or two rules, and you can make you know, 20 or 30 paintings just from that. Simplicity is really can create a ton of complexity. Which is a great metaphor for life and what's happening. Yeah. You know, when you look at the fundamentals of life, seemingly so 
um, simple and basic and the complexity that mm. derives from that yeah. is amazing. And your process also involves a lot of, of preparation in, in terms of before you start. Yeah, it's and, more of a, it's like a two-step process actually. I set up these containers of paint in a very specific way and that takes a really long time. And then the entire canvas or whatever I'm working on is actually all wet at the same time. And now I have seconds to make decisions. So that's the exciting part. That's the part that reminds me more of something like surfing. It's an adrenaline rush. And I've spent so much time preparing these containers of pain. So by the time they're flowing on the surface, I have a lot of time in. So it's sort of a stress level, but sort of it's super exhilarating at the same time. And I can mix the same colors. There's a series on the back wall of about six orbiting around the one circle. So those were all made one after another, right at the same time, the same preparations of paint. And you can see how each one pretty much comes out totally differently. It's like that snowflake idea that there is, you know, you start with a simple thing, but quickly, it turns into something much more expansive and sort of it relates to that fractal theory that you know patterns repeat but then they can repeat in chaotic and different different ways so each up it's one tiny little change changes the entire outcome right. so if i pour in a little more to the left or a little more to the right it's going to be an entirely different painting and it starts out exactly the same so to me it's endlessly engaging because you start out with a set of parameters, like Kelsey said, and then you watch all of these things kind of unfold before your eyes. So it's, it's exciting. And it's, uh, it's the most entertainment, entertaining thing I do. I mean, I get in there. It's not meditative because it's happened so quick. The preparation of the buckets can be meditative, but I fortunately have some assistants who help out with some of that now. So I get to do the fun part. Uh, but each painting I do, even if it's the same configuration of paint, it's gonna come out different, but then it will suggest 10 other paintings. So I have the next 10 paintings in mind. So it's endlessly feeding back into itself and changing the output each time. And you moved to LA, how, how recently? Like six years ago. Six years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm inspired by I mean, art, artists, I guess, like Yayo Kusama, um, Tara Donovan, uh, Tom Friedman, Paper Rad, I don't know. I mean, these guys. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah like all, all sorts of artists. Um, definitely there's, with the, the artists that I love, there's a theme of like process and accumulation and just like, um, like how Kusama just like goes into this crazy world of like infinity and um, multiplication and stuff. Um, yeah, those are kind of the themes that I love with art. Um, yeah, I was uh, here hanging the show right before the, uh, the day before the opening and uh, I got a call from both uh, Jen and Kelsey that one of their huge fans, Wayne Quinn from the Flaming Lips, was <laughs> going to be in town for one night, and could he come by the show kind of on the late side to see it? And, uh, and it was a thrill for me that he and his girlfriend showed up wearing clothing um, of each of your with paintings um, uh, on it. And, um, and I just thought it was very cool how you inspired someone from uh, another artistic discipline to spend their one night in LA, visiting a gallery late at night. Um, and I, I've seen that with all three of you, that you have a real inspiration um, to and from other artists, you know, kind of cross-discipline that, you know, that seems to really um, um, be a quality in your work and, and, mm -hmm. and how you are as people that um, I find inspiring. Uh, Talk about how you see your work evolving in other mediums. I know, Jen, you're, you know, you're doing these public art projects, you've got some clothing design and so on. Is that a threat for your work being taken seriously or is everything your canvas and... Um... 
Um, I mean, I, I consider like everything my canvas. I also think like a lot of things are changing in the art world and they don't have to like abide by these like specific rules that they have in the past. Um, but yeah, my like, I really love like the public art route. Like, I just love that it reaches such a vast audience and um, it's an awesome challenge to like make your artwork on a monumental scale. So that's, that's kind of like the path that I'm going down um, right now and doing more like animation and interactive stuff. Um, yeah, just like a whole variety. Interesting. Kelsey, how do you see your work evolving um, across various mediums of you? You talk about being interested in uh, perhaps sculpture and um, moving into other disciplines. And I can see your work kind of morphing and evolving in, in ways that uh, are leaving the two-dimensional picture plane, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, sculpture, so I did my first sculpture show. It's still up right now um, in San Diego, at Quaint Gallery. But that was the first sculpture show. It took me a year to turn these ideas into sculptures. Um, but that's been really fun. That's been super exciting. Because it, you know, again, it's like total green pastures. You're like, oh my, there's so much to do here. Like it's semi overwhelming, but exciting at the same time. So uh, I guess that's how I look at everything in my life. Exciting and overwhelming. <laughs> And Andy, how about you? I mean, I see your work evolving all the time. I, mean, I love it's how always you shifting and changing the forms. I sort of am married to the wall. I sort of like the, the notion that it's on the wall, but I would never rule anything out, so I could easily do some sculptures. But I think even over the next 40 years, or however much time I have left, I could never do all the paintings that I have in my mind. So I'm pretty focused in on painting at the moment. You, you never know when that'll shift. But I've definitely worked on three-dimensional forms, but they've always been on the wall. I think there's one in the slideshow that's up high. It was on that wall over there. Vertical curve, I've done horizontal curves, I've done convex, concave. Um, haven't done anything that just stands on the ground yet, but the future's wide open. What, uh, what's the biggest misconception people may have initially about your work? Do you, have, you, do you find people ever reading it in a way that um, feels like they're not quite getting what your, your interest or pursuit is? Any of you? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only so? thing that happens. <laughs> I guess that's just because I'm not doing my job properly, but um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, so often and this no, please, nobody in here take offense. Please don't. But like, I will make that, and I will kill myself to get this concept right, and I will kill myself to get the location of atoms in the exact right place, you know, relative to everything else. So, I mean, that is really what's going on inside of this toxin molecule. And I will kill myself to do it, and then somebody will buy it because it looks nice behind their couch. Mm -hmm. The colors match their drapes or something. I'm like, oh, yeah, but, <laughs> but. So conversely, do you have scientists come in and go, oh my fucking God, dude, <laughs> so what the hell? That, ha that has just happened this year, and it's like the coolest thing I could ever imagine. Like getting to sit down and talk to somebody who like can dialogue, not can, but is interested in dialoguing about that is awesome. And there's a, um, there's a, real, or a, a real estate company in San Diego that's building out all these big lab campuses. So these are for all, San Diego's huge for biotech, that's what got me down there. But they're building out these big campuses, so like five or six different biotech companies, they're getting some tech companies to go in, and they're putting in all these cool restaurants and workout facilities. They're trying to get like mini Googles, mini tech companies um, down in San Diego. And th this company has just started putting my art up inside of the labs and in the foyers and stuff. And I was just like, oh, yes. <laughs> I was so psyched. That was like the best thing ever. I love the correspondence between art and science and, you know, and people realizing that the two are so interconnected yeah. in so many ways. And if you look historically, you know, artists um, had uh, tremendous training in the sciences and, uh, and, and so on. And, and that separation, I think, is, is one that um, uh, should be uh, 
we evaluate it, you know, the, in people's minds anyway. You know, when yeah. you teach kids in school, there's this STEM concept and uh, where the arts aren't part of the, the, uh, that equation. Um, but I think more and more there's been an effort to see that the arts are part of all of this. How do you visualize sciences through art often? Jen, any misconceptions people have about your work that? Um, well, I mean, if anything, it's like the stoner community or like psychedelia world that doesn't really like understand the concepts behind it. And I mean, everybody takes away what they want. Um, but yeah, it's usually that sort of side of it. It's, yeah, attractive to like a bunch of different audiences, so, which is cool, also. Yeah, no, I know, if we had done this show when I was in college, the gallery would have been filled with people just zoning out, tripping in front of these paintings <laughs> and going, whoa. <laughs> um, Andy, do you, have, do you have people that read your work in ways that, uh, that you feel they don't get I quite mean, what sure, you're I mean, sure, I think everyone with? does, but for the most part, I feel like I have a certain audience here in LA, which is great, and I've sort of, we've kind of gone down this road together, or discovering things together, and it's exciting. It's great to be in a show with the two of you, because I feel like there's a lot of commonality in this work, and it's work that, I think it's important that it gets seen right now. It's sort of, it's an alternative to some other possibilities, and I think that each of us is sort of carving out a niche in this discovery of connecting science, nature, psychedelia, pattern and fractals, so many things coming together. And I think we're each approaching it in a different way, but I think it's very um, current work and sort of pushing the boundaries of abstraction into all these new places. Because the history of abstraction also is very, it, it can be very narrow. And then you've got pictorialism, do people doing, uh, you know, pictorial paintings and then narrow groups of abstract paintings. And I, I feel like we're all pushing the boundaries of ab abstract painting out of just that pure definition of abstraction into nature and finding those kind of the thread between the two, which is really interesting. <laughs> I, I think that's what inspired me so much about putting this show together was um, seeing how much you each draw on nature as a source of inspiration for your work. Um, and I had someone coming in, come in, who wanted to write about the show, and they said, "Oh yeah, it's all, it's pattern, you know, it's, it's this pattern show." And I said, "There are patterns there, but they're patterns derived from nature and from these elements that have these forces." Um, uh, sort of unleashed in the uh, composition of these pieces that go f beyond just uh, design kind of patterns. The, there's an there's a, a inherent logic that derives from nature in them. Well, there was, as everyone knows, uh, P&D, they call it pattern and decoration back in the 70s and 80s. And I think that our work is so different from that because that was sort of looking at domestic things and tablecloths and sort of patterns in a domestic setting. And I think we're all exploring patterns on a cosmological kind of level, on a much bigger and more interesting scale. And uh, I haven't seen a lot of this kind of work up to now, so I think it's an, it's an exciting moment. And we didn't, I didn't get a chance to speak about sort of some of my painterly influences, but I love these guys' work. But I feel like this kind of work that's dealing with space and motion and light can be traced back to Venetian painting as well. Bellini and Titian and all the way through to Turner and John Martin, the great landscape painters. Mm -hmm. Because this is about nature, but rather than standing out in a field and looking out and seeing the sun shining and reflecting off of things, this is sort of going inside the atom and out into the galaxies and inside the psychedelic space, which Psychedelic means mind manifesting. So I think that we're all exploring this space that's between pure mental space and space that's out there in nature simultaneously. It's a psychoactive 
<laughs> quality to the work that it taps into something that is not rational. That's you know, I feel like when I look at this work, there's a little bit of an explosion in my brain that um, uh, is unexpected. You know, that you get when you look at artwork that hits you. And, and, it, and it kind of hits you in a, a not logical, not rational way. It's a different part of the brain that gets activated. And um, uh, it, I think, is interesting that at this time, there's a um, doctor friend of mine who's just started a um, uh, neurologic institute. It's a little boutique of, of um, doctors and uh, uh, neurologists who are um, uh, really exploring um, kind of cutting edge areas of treating various neurologic disorders. But in, in that process, they are um, starting to explore the benefits of, of psilocybin and some of the other hallucinogens in tapping into um, people's consciousness in a way that I think you are doing through your work. Mm -hmm. That's my kind of doctor. <laughs> <laughs> You'll meet him. I'll, I'll make sure you meet him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hopefully this can take you to the same kind of space. Yeah. I think it is that metaphysical notion of painting that you can look at something and, yeah, your frequency changes, hopefully. To me, that's good painting. Yeah.